let's get into our study. We're going to be looking today at, at 1 John chapter 3, verse, beginning at verse, and you know what I did? I wrote the wrong, verse 11, I, I'm going to have to move this real quick, because I put the wrong scriptures on my, on my um, whatever this is called. Anyways, so I'll begin, I'm actually going to read verse 11, we stopped at verse 10 last time, I'm going to read verse 11, but I'm going to... Uh, you know how I do it. I'm going to basically give you an introduction by referring to a little bit prior to that. But we're, we're going to begin here in verse 11 and uh, review some things and then move into our study. So in 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, it says, This is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now, last time we were together, when we closed our last study, John had made a very important point. He had said in verse 10, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. And so to those who, um, those who belong to the devil, he said, and it's very clear, he said they do not practice righteousness. In other words, the unbeliever doesn't desire to live a life that is pure and a life that's set apart. That's a holy life. Those who belong to the devil, and this is the, the language that John is inspired to use, those who belong to the devil uh, sin, but they sin habitually. It's not as if, if we believers, we who believe in Christ, are sinlessly perfect. We, he, John isn't teaching that, and, and, and that's not what we believe because that's not what Scripture teaches. It's just that we don't live a life of habitual sin, practicing it and enjoying it. You see, in, in the life of an unbeliever, John is making it clear, uh, that unbeliever sees no reason to cease living the life that they're living. So they can lie or they can steal, they can hurt others, they can gossip, they can fight, they can get drunk, they can hate, and they have no remorse. There's no concern or care in their heart. For them, it's natural. And because it's natural, uh, they don't care. And not only that, and we see this, and Jesus made it clear, but they can see us as believers, as their enemy. And when they look at us as their enemy, they feel it right that they should hate us. And so John was saying that that kind of life reveals them for what they are. They are children, he said, of the devil. In opposition to this, a believer does not practice sin. Instead, he says, a believer will practice righteousness and lives excellently. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, uh, Paul said it like this. He said, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And so when I was preparing this and I was looking at Philippians 4, 8, I wanted to give you a little bit more of what, it's, what he's saying. So obviously in verse 8 when he says whatever is true, we know that what truth is. We don't have to look at that much closer than that. But he uses a word like noble, which is a word we don't use very often normally in normal conversation. The word noble speaks of something that is honorable. Whatever is right, well, the word right is speaking of that which is fair. Whatever is pure. That speaks of modesty. Whatever is lovely, that speaks of that which is pleasing. Whatever is admirable, that's something that is well reported of. If anything is excellent, that speaks of being upright or praiseworthy, which means commendable. He says, think or meditate about such things. That's what believers are commanded in Philippians 4 verse 8 to do, is to think on these kinds of things the things that are right and pure and lovely and admirable and all of that. And so that is going to be something not only that you meditate on, but it's something that through your meditation on and seeking the Lord, you're going to live those ways. That'll be, in other words, the elements of your life. So righteousness, when we speak of that, includes a relationship to God as well as your relationship to man. Our faith and our love for God is what produces a love for people. So instead of hating, Christians have brotherly love for other believers. That's why in Hebrews 13, 1, the writer said, let brotherly love continue. Or Peter in 1 Peter 1, 22, since you've purified your souls by obedience to the truth so that you have a genuine love for your brothers, 
Love one another deeply from a pure heart. Love one another deeply. John and I were having a conversation. We put it on our whatever that thing's called, unfiltered. And um, we were speaking about just, just the relationships that we have with one another. And I was mentioning to him, this is something I'll just say quickly, but it's not in my notes, but it's something that comes to mind. I would encourage you, if you have any Bible helps, you, if you've got a computer, you can go to uh, various sources on the computer and you can find some good information. I use, for example, BibleHub.com. I use that. Uh, but there are others, and you can look at it if you'd like to. And if you want to approach me and ask me what I use, I'll tell you. BibleHub.com, because that's basically it. Because the other th- it, it gives you several commentaries. It gives you exhaustive con- concordance. It's a, it's, a, it's a great help for me when I'm preparing studies and all. So if you went to a concordance and you began to look up the words one another, especially in the New Testament, it gives you insight. It gives you insight into what the church is supposed to be. There's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian when who's just on your own, just bopping from one place to another, going from one church here, going to that church there. I haven't used the word bop in a long time. Where'd that come from? But anyway, <laughs> that's an old word. By Jiminy, that was an old word. But, you know, <laughs> church hopping is not healthy. See, the Lord Jesus Christ created the church for a reason, so that we could together be what is called the body of Christ and use the gifts and abilities God has gifted us with to serve him and serve man. And so when you read the scriptures, just look up in your concordance, if you do that, the words one another. You're going to see we pray for one another. We, we exhort one another, we love one another. We have fellowship with one another. We have strong relationships. Every one of the New Testament epistles give to you commands as it pertains to how the church is supposed to be. And so one of the things the enemy has tried to do over time is to destroy the fellowship that we have one with another. That's why we're not to forsake the fellowshipping with one another. Why? Because we have been joined together as the body of Christ. Now, I was sharing with John yesterday, of course, we take into consideration when we look at such scriptures that there are those who have the inability to be here. There are those watching right now online who can't be here. Thank God we have the ability to broadcast and others can be there, be with us in that way. But it's kind of like having a, I was reading this, some of you perhaps did too, it's kind of like having one of, you know, a video of a fireplace. You know, and you're sitting in front of it with your marshmallow. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't work, right? Because it's just, it's just something that some, is happening someplace else. And so we're called to love one another, pray for one another, exhort one another, confront sometimes one another, to lift one another up. We're supposed to do that. Why? Because that's what the body does. The body of Christ works together. And as the body of Christ works together, it does so by the love of God. So an unbeliever doesn't care about other people. I'm not saying that an unbeliever doesn't have natural affection. Of course, they do. Jesus spoke concerning the fact, he said, even those who don't know him love one another. They have a a love. What we're talking about is the love of Christ. They don't have that. And that's not the motivation of the things that they do. And so what we're called to be is we're we're called to be the body of Christ. And and how are people who don't know Jesus going to know that we do? Well, one of the ways is through the love that we have for one another. So instead of hating people, we're to have brotherly love, especially for other believers. That has been called the birthmark of the Christian. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, Paul said, As touching brotherly love, you need not that I write to you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And so that's the message in verse 11. That's the announcement, he's saying, that you have heard from the beginning. That announcement, that message is the God of love has loved us. And that love has been revealed by Jesus Christ. And when we have come into that understanding of the love God has had for us through Jesus, then we love each other. Now, that message is not new. Notice how he said again in verse 11, this is the message that you heard from the beginning. It's not a new message. It's something he's saying, you know well. 
All the way back in the Gospel of John in chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. So this isn't a new idea. This is something that has been part of what God has commanded for us to have to, towards one another. And so he says, this is the message that you heard from the beginning, and we should love one another. Not, verse 12, as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Why did he murder him? Because his, his deeds were evil, his brother's works were righteous. Now, when it speaks in verse 12 of Cain, who was of the wicked one and the murderer, that, that is recorded in Genesis chapter 4 for those of you who take notes. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, that Cain, one of the sons of Adam and Eve, was a tiller of the ground. He had a younger brother. His name was Abel, and he was a shepherd. It speaks of the fact that they both had come and offered sacrifices to God. The scripture says that Cain offered the fruit of the ground, but Abel, uh, rather, yeah, Abel, but Abel offered the firstborn of his flock. So Cain offered the fruit of the ground, Abel, the firstborn of the flock. It says in verse 12, though, that John, uh, John says that Cain murdered his brother Abel. Now, that word murdered, if you take notes, it's a strong word. Obviously, the word murder is a strong word, but it literally means to slaughter or to butcher. That's a very strong word that he, he, he cut the throat of his brother. That's the literal translation. He butchered him because he says Cain's works were evil and Abel's were righteous. Now, here's the thing. Why were Cain's works declared evil? Why would John refer to that? Why would God not accept one and accept the other? What was the difference between the two? God offered, you know, you can offer God grain sacrifices in the law of Moses. There were offerings that you made of the grain. There were offerings made that way. So why would he declare one to be acceptable and the other not? Well, Cain's were not done with faith. Hebrews 11 verse 4 says it like this. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet speaks. So Cain gave the work of his hands, but Abel gave the first of his flock. And that sacrifice gave to him, gave a, a, an understanding that he knew that his offering was not by works, but was by faith. Both of them are religious. Both made an offering to God. Again, Cain offered the fruit of the ground, Abel the firstlings of his flock. But God accepted Abel's and rejected Cain's. It says in Genesis 4, verses 4 and 5, the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So each of these men represent a different approach to God and man. Now, what's the difference in their sacrifice? I mentioned it already, their faith. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Well, what made Abel's sacrifice to God acceptable? Again, it was approved because he was obedient. God had instituted blood sacrifice. He brought out of his flock an offering. Cain came in his own way, offering the sweat of his work. And so anybody who's trying to live a religious life in their own power will be rejected because you come to God by faith, not by works. You're not saved by your works. Now, secondly, Abel's offering was approved because he had a right heart. He brought the firstlings. That meant he represented, that represented the best offering that he could give. In Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. A third thing is Abel's offering was approved, as mentioned already, because it was of faith. Cain's offering was motivated by a desire to come to God on his own terms. And God refused his offering because works will not bring you to God. So Cain is still looked at and Abel is still looked at. But Abel is regarded as righteous. And though he is physically dead, his faith is still living as a witness and is still spoken of. 
But Cain is remembered as a murderer. So as he's saying this, you love one another. You don't be like Cain. He goes on to verse 13. He says, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Do not marvel. Don't be amazed if the world detests you. The world, the people who live in what has been called a pagan death culture. That's what we live in. I, I, I've got so much to go through. I don't want to spend too much time in this. But the world, I mentioned to you in 1 John chapter 2, when it speaks about love not the world, neither the things of the world, I mentioned to you that the way the word world is used there is speaking of a death system, a pagan cultural death system. And, and that may sound kind of like odd to you, but tell me if, if this isn't true. In our recent uh, elections that took place, one of the main issues, one of the main issues was abortion. And there are those who were saying that because one candidate favored it while the other rejected it, that a lot of votes went to the candidate who accepted it. That is a visible picture of what I'm trying to say. It is a pagan death system. That's what it is. It celebrates death and not life. And that's why the world will hate you, because you disagree with their assumptions that these are the proper things and freedoms that people have a right to. So he says, don't be marveling at this. Don't be marveling if the world hates or detests you. In John 15, 18, Jesus said, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me first. In Matthew 10, 22, you will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. And again, I've said this so many times, it comes to mind every time I read Matthew 10, 22. We have those little treasure chests of scriptures and scriptural promises. How would you feel if you pulled that out as your promise for the day? You know, you'll be hated by everyone. I think this is Marie's. I'm sorry, baby. I took your, I took your promise today. I'll give it back to you. But that's a fact. The people who are members of this pagan culture of death, he said, will detest you. So he goes on into verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. We're not like Cain. We don't hate each other. We love one another. A love for others demonstrates we're no longer spiritually dead. And by the way, that love that you have for others provides an assurance of salvation. Notice again in verse 14, he who does not love his brother abides in death. Again, not loving others is an earmark of the unbeliever. Now, verse 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. You know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That's an interesting scripture. When someone hates, they reveal that they are like the first murderer came. Someone wrote, every degree of hate is revealing the kind of temper that led to murder. Now, John will make statements. In verse 16, he says it like this. Well, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. I want to show you something here. Look at verse 16. Notice how he says, by this we know. By this we know love. As we've been going through uh, 1 John, I'll, I'll read some scriptures to you because he likes to use the phrase, by this we know. In chapter 2, verse 3, he had said, by this we know uh, that we know him if we keep his commandments. In chapter 2, verse 5, it says, whoever keeps his word in him truly is the love of God perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Chapter 3, verse 19, by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Chapter 3, 24, he who keeps his commandments dwells in him and he in him, and by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit which has been given to us. Chapter 4, verse 2, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Chapter 4, verse 6, we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Chapter 4, verse 13, by this we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Chapter 5, one last one, verse 2, 
By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. All of those things are important to know. By this we know. How can I have an assurance? He gave me of his spirit. How can I have an assurance? Because I love the brethren. How can I have an assurance? I love his commandments. These are things that can help you to understand your standing with the Lord. And so now he's saying in verse 16, by this we know love. Because he laid down his life for us. By this we know love. Again, I'm just going to share a little from my heart about these kinds of things at this point. Before you got saved, and maybe if you're not saved, this, this may be something that you might want to hear. Before you got saved, we'll, 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 we'll put you in your teen years because that's easier to kind of illustrate. And you met somebody, and you were attracted to them. I guarantee you, you weren't thinking 30 or 40 years from now. I guarantee it. You were just thinking of right now, or maybe whatever, the, the short future. You're not thinking of, of a lot of things. I, I, I know that's true because perhaps I'm over-identifying, but I think that's just generally true of, of human beings. You know, you're going out on your first date. You're having your first romantic feelings, you know. You're, you, you have your first holding hands. You have your first kiss goodnight. You have all those things. Those are exhilarating. They're new. And you, and you learn some things about relationships. I mean, you're not, you're not, you know, you're 16 years old. You're going to the prom. You're not going to treat it necessarily like you're getting married. You're fortunate you got a date in the first place. So it's not going to be something like that. What it's going to be is just an enjoyable evening, or hopefully so. But as you get older and you've, you've gone out a few times, you've had different relationships, you begin to, to consider what does it really mean to have a relationship and what am I really looking for in a person? Because over time you begin to realize that, that uh, dating, you know, it can be fun, exciting, enjoyable and all of that. But it's not necessarily mo the, the, the thing that keeps you going. The thing that will keep you going you get to know is, is a long-term relationships. And so what happened with me is I began to kind of whittle down certain things that at one time I thought were very important. And, and I began to, in the Lord, I began to actually grow up a little bit. And I began to think of the things that really, really mattered. So I eventually got to the point where I had prayed and sought, to, sought the Lord about relationship. And, and I had prayed and, and said to him, I, I don't want to... Uh, make a mistake with the most important decision I'm going to make outside of coming to faith in Christ, which is to ask someone to love, uh, love me and marry me and be a mama to our babies and all of that. I actually started thinking that, and so that's when I had asked the Lord to put me to sleep to my desires. What I was really asking him to do was to help me to think as a mature person and not as somebody who is just caught up with what I see and not really looking for the qualities that really make a person what they are. It isn't that I was asking the Lord for somebody that wasn't appealing. It was that I was asking the Lord to give to me something, rather someone who, who, who could help me to be the best that I would be. That, because I had come to believe, and I still do, that, that, that I'm a composite person. I, I have the Holy Spirit who has made me whole in him. But the two became one flesh. I'm, I'm, and, you know, I am filled in the, in the areas of my life that are, that are, are lacking, I've been, those gaps have been filled by somebody who, who can help me to become what I want to be. Well, that's been going on for a long time. And so love actually becomes something deeper than just an emotion. It, it becomes a decision. It, it becomes an action. It, it, it actually is something that is not only experienced, but it's actually practiced and expressed, you know, because... There are things that you couldn't pay me enough to do that I did out of love. You know, when my kids were sick and they're barfing on the ground and I have to go clean that up, you couldn't pay me to go clean up that stuff. You know, I, 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 but I did it. Why did I do it? Because Marie wouldn't. No, I did it. <laughs> I did it because I loved my babies. There are things you do out of love that nobody could pay you to do otherwise. 
That's when I started understanding what love really is. It's not an emotion, it's a decision. Emotions follow the decision. You make the decision to do the right thing, and the right thing produces a fruit that makes it a beautiful decision to have made. And it's not just, you know, these emotions, because as a minister, I can tell you over the years that I've met many, many, many people, and, and some people have been very pleasant to speak to, and, and others have been difficult. I mean, we human beings, we have our difficulties, and, and it's okay. I'm not judging, but I'm telling you that sometimes people can be real draining. We all know that. Sometimes we can be draining. We all know that. But what makes a person not run from somebody who has drained them? It's the love of Christ. It's the love for that person. It's, it's a desire to see God move in that person. Where did I learn that? I learned it from Jesus. I learned it from a woman named Marie. I learned it from so many people that I love. They've taught me how to do that. And so I'm not, forgive me, I don't know why I get, I get broken up. I just do. To love is the mark of a believer. To be there when, when they need you is the mark of a believer. To sacrifice is the mark of a believer. To hold on when things are rough and, and, and it doesn't seem like you're going to make it, it's a mark of a believer. It, it's, it's, it's loving to the end. Paul said that husbands are to love their wives. Well, that's great, Paul. What do you mean by that? Well, let's remember Jesus. Scripture in John 13 says, having loved them, he loved them to the end. What did he do? He sacrificed for them because in John 13, he washed the feet of the, the apostles and he ultimately laid his life down for them. Love is demonstrated by sacrifice and service. Love is not just an emotion. Love is experiencing life together, holding fast to one another. And that demonstrates that the love we have is of higher quality because those in the world, when it gets tough sometimes they just get going but there are those in the lord it gets tough when you go through that and you grow together and you experience life together the ups and the downs the good times and the sad and so as a church i think that people bail out on others because they're irritating or they're not perfect or they're not the kind of person i want to hang around with they're not one of the beautiful people that that i'm used to hanging around I had someone leave this church for that reason. They told me that. You know, do you have any beautiful counselors? My wife won't go to an ugly one. Now, I'm serious. I mean, so I said, you better go. Because <laughs> we're not into that. We're into truth and love, not outer appearance. We're into that. See, that's what... And I, you know, I was just thinking about that today. He laid down his life for us. God's love is demonstrated in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He laid down his life for us. He laid it down voluntarily. In John 10, verse 11, Jesus said it like this. He said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. In John 10, 17 and 18, therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. It is also vicarious. The death of Christ is on behalf of others. It was for us. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, I just quoted that. God demonstrates his own love for us in that in this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then a third thing about the death of Christ, and because he loved us, it was victorious. It was laid down one time for all time. In Hebrews 10, 11 through 14, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever 
those who are being made holy. Jesus' death is voluntary, vicarious, and victorious. And he says in verse 16, because he laid down his life for us, we lay down our lives also. Now, when he says lay down, we lay down, that, that, that speaks of a way of life. It, it speaks of a voluntary, continual habit of laying down your life. It's our habit because family life is sacrificial life. We know that too, don't we? Family life is sacrificial life. My dad taught me that. I watched my father. My dad never gave me ever in my life ever a lecture on loving. Never. I, my dad was real quiet, like many men of his generation. He didn't tell me stuff. I, I To this very day, I was sharing with the men just the other day in, in a mentoring class that I do. I was sharing that my father never told. I, I had no idea how much money my father made. Not, a, not, a, not an idea. Not even an idea. I had no idea. I knew he went to work. I knew he came home. I knew he paid the bills, and I knew he did those kinds of things. But I never knew what my dad made. My dad never spoke to me about finances. I had to learn about that on my own. He never lectured me about certain things that I think are real important things to know. But my dad never did. But the thing that I, I value, I think, above everything else about lessons you learn by watching was my father taught me something that I brought into my own marriage without even knowing it. It was, it was something that I absorbed from watching him by observing him and not even noting that I was doing that. And it, he taught me how to love a woman. My father did. My father taught me how to love a wife. I watched him love my mom. I watched him. I never saw him. I never saw my dad kiss my mom. My dad didn't do that. My dad would walk in. He'd look at my mom. My mom had these dreamy eyes for him. It's kind of our, our charm, isn't it, baby? But anyway, <laughs> my dad never did that. My dad thought certain things are private, and his affection for my mom was. But as a son, I would watch my father, and I saw him work hard. I saw him feed his family. I saw sacrifice all through his life. And I've shared this before. It comes to mind. And when he had a heart attack where he eventually went home to be with Jesus. When, I, when my mom had called me, I'll say this quickly. You've all heard it, but it comes to mind. My mom called me. I went to the hospital, Marie and I, and my father had a heart attack. She said, your daddy had a heart attack. And I said, yeah, mama. You know what he did? And I said, what's that? He prayed. Well, I knew my dad would pray, of course. You know what he prayed? What? He prayed, Jesus, take care of my wife. Even when he died, his last word that I know, he never called my mother by her name. Forgive me for this emotion. I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm trying to emphasize something. The last word I know my father said was to my mom. And she was standing there. They had to remove her from his room. The doctor said it's unhealthy for his heart. The minute he sees you, his heart starts beating too fast. The last word he ever said was to her was what he called her, as long as I can remember, which was mama. He never used her name. It was always mama. And, and he taught me these things. See, so love is something, if you're fortunate enough to have somebody in your life that, that does it like that, you disregard some of the things that were probably things you wouldn't want to do yourself. Nobody's perfect. There were things my dad would do that, mm, that's not me. But the thing that mattered was love. See, so my father taught me, our father taught us through Jesus how to love. And love is sacrificial. And that's what brothers and sisters do for one another. We sacrifice so he makes, uh, he makes a point here, verse 17, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Generosity is, is a, uh, a genuine and outward expression of the love of God. It reveals compassion. I'm standing around all of these presents. These aren't all of them. These are just some we brought out. That the fellowship out of compassion is giving to children who, if they didn't receive this, wouldn't receive anything. Generosity is a genuine expression of the love of God. And to refuse to have concern for believers is to prove faithlessness. 
because material things are shared with those in genuine need. 2 Corinthians 8, 7 says it like this, but just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. You see, it's one thing to talk about love, but love is more than just talking. It is something that is openly demonstrated. He says in verse 17, this person, this person shuts up his heart from him. In other words, lip service and the theory of love doesn't cut it. Voluntarily uh, refusing to have compassion reveals that you don't have an understanding of the love of God. You see, we don't need heroic acts of martyrdom as much as simple daily acts of love. And so he goes on in verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Word, tongue, deed, truth, philosophic speech about love will not fill a, a hungry stomach. And so he goes on in verse 19, and he says, And by this, we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all thing, things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. By this we know that we're of the truth. We know that God gave, and we know that Jesus gave. And when we give, we evidence that we are his children. The obedience of love demonstrates salvation, and that gives to us a proper assurance. When he says in verse 20, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. He knows all. God understands us better than we understand ourselves. Psalm 103 verse 14 says he knows our frame. He knows our framework. He remembers that we're dust. He knows who we are. You see, sometimes we may attempt to serve him and fail, and, and we feel bad about that. But guess what? He already knows us. He's never surprised by my failures. He never is. I, I never do anything that he didn't already know I could and would do. In Jeremiah 17, 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. You've never done anything that surprised God. Nothing. He knew what you would do with the gospel when he gave it to you, and he gave it to you anyway. He knew what I would do, and he gave me the gospel anyway. He's not surprised, but when I fail, my heart can condemn me. I because I, I don't want to. It's in, and I, I think I'm speaking for us when I say that. It's not like I plan to do this, like I'm looking to do this. I want to do this. I want to fail. If there's anything that I don't want to do, is I don't want to fail. I don't want to fail him, but I do. I'm not always as loving as I'd like to be. I'm not always as generous as I'd like to be. I'm not always as kind as I'd like to be. I'm not always what I want to be. But God knows that already. My heart will accuse me. My heart will say, look at you, you slug. You act as if you're so good, and you're not. And I always have some cheerleader on the side to let me know how bad I am, too. I, I did a pastor's conference one time, and a guy walked up to me after the conference, and he says, you're not that good a speaker. That was immediately after I spoke, and I smiled at him, and I said, well, thank you. He goes, well, my gift is the gift of keeping pastors humble. I said, well, we really need you in the body of Christ, now don't we? <laughs> so you know what? You're never as good as you think you are, and you're never as bad as someone says you are. You're usually somewhere in the middle. You're usually there. You're going to fall. You know, I don't, I'm not prophesying that you will, but you know you will. I know I will. We're still flesh. He knows our frame. We're flesh. But we fail less and less over time because we grow more and more in him. And when we yield ourselves to his powerful Holy Spirit, I think that if there's anything lacking in many people's lives today, it's the baptism, powerful baptism of the Spirit where the Holy Spirit has empowered you. Sometimes we try to practice righteousness with 
fleshly tools. God says, you're going to fail. That's why I gave you the Holy Spirit. You need to call on me in your time of need and ask me. I, I, I do that constantly. I do it every day. Lord, just refill me, work within me, make your presence known to me, use me for your glory. I can't do it on my own because, you know, we, we do fail and my heart will condemn me. But God is greater than my heart. He says in verse 21, he says, if our heart doesn't condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Well, we remember that God knows everything and, and, and our hearts will not condemn you, condemn us as we know that. And with that, we do approach him with confidence. And and when he says that we have confidence toward God, he goes on to say in verse 22, Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us we can confidently pray because our hearts are right with God now when he's speaking in that way we receive from him that's not a blank check we we pray according to his will we desire to obey him we want to please him and 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 God gives us what is an assurance now the way I can have assurance is is one I know that I belong to him and I can come to him as a child and second I ask him to give me purity of heart because Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And then I ask him in, in genuine faith filled anticipation. I'm asking, Lord, but I know that you're going to move like it says in Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Then there are times you pray with persistence, like it says in Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. And the word ask, seek, and knock are all in a Greek tense. That means continue to do so. So I ask with persistence. But I always want to ask according to God's will. We'll see this in chapter 5, verse 14. This is the confidence we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So what is his commandment, verse 23? That we should believe on the name of his son. Again, belief and love go together by trusting in Jesus and seeing what he's done for us and actually not only accepting it, but being fully immersed in the knowledge of the love of God gives to us a compassionate love for other people. And our, our, our assurance of salvation isn't going to come through an imperfect obedience. What my, insur my, assur my assurance comes from is the witness of the Holy Spirit. It's that Holy Spirit witness. My mom used to say it like this. I know that I know that I know. That's how she would say it. David, I just know that I know that I know. And I'd say, well, you know. She goes, I just know. No. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. We are children of God. If I can leave you with anything I'd like to leave you with that tonight. The spirit bears witness with my spirit. It isn't by works of righteousness, which I've done. It's the, not the amount of prayer that I pray or the amount of Bible reading that I read. It's not the amount of teachings that I've done. I've been teaching the Bible since 1973, 49 years. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Bible studies, hours upon hours upon hours of, of studying and then teaching, thousands of hours. I'm not saved by that. I don't have an assurance through that. I have an assurance by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit. No, you belong to God. That is something you'll never get through works of righteousness. That's something... That is something you do not get by trying hard. That is something that comes from the inside. It's an internal witness. I belong to God. The enemy has, especially at the beginning of my life with Christ, the enemy tried to convince me that, that I was just having some kind of weird experience, but in fact I wasn't any different and I wasn't changed and I was, was just deluding myself. 
But as I grew in the Lord, I began to read more. I began to study more. I began to fellowship more. I began to be taught more. I began to realize that that sense within me wasn't some kind of false pride or some wishful thinking. The Holy Spirit is bearing witness with my spirit. I belong to him. I belong to him. That's what believers have is an assurance of the spirit, not by works, but by his Holy Spirit that has provoked the things that you do. And so why do you do the things that you do? Why do I do what I do? Because of him. Because he has motivated me to do that. And that's why you do what you do. Our Father, we ask.